uh, oh. I'd like to welcome Rebecca, who's come to present. I can see Urvisha is here. Um, I've got apologies from Helen Goddard from uh, Audit Wales. Otherwise, I've had no other apologies. And um, I've got, um, I, I need to ask about declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest that people need to make that are all, yes, Avion? Yes, Chair. Um, Chair, sorry, could we hold on? I, I, I'm just a message saying that we're not yet live. Could we just get confirmation from Fiona that... Yes, we are live and oh. recording now. Thank okay. you very much. Oh, it's bad. Thank you. Okay, uh, go ahead, Avion. Chair, there's an item later on in the agenda uh, with the contract arrangement with Swansea University. Yes. But uh, I, uh, in being a member of the uh, uh, finance committee, although I have not... I have excluded myself from any activity over the last year. Yeah, I still think it would be prudent for me to exclude myself from that item. Uh, Thank you, Ivion. It's noted. Thank you. So we've got an imp we always like an improvement story, um, Rebecca. So um, can, I, can I introduce that? Of course you can, Lisa. It's just that I know Rebecca, you see. So it's, I, know. I got a bit excited to see her again. <laughs> so go on then, Lisa. Thank you. So, bore da pau, but you play ser gyda fi i gyflwyno Rebecca Thomas, mae Rebecca yn arweinydd gofal a diogelu cleifion yng Nghwm Tad. Um, dechreuodd Rebecca ei ysgoloriaeth gyda Cymrydoriaeth Florence Nightingale ym mis Ebrill Eleni. Um, good morning, everybody. Pleasure it is to introduce Rebecca Thomas, who is the Patient Care and Safety Lead uh, nurse in Coombe Tav and started her Florence Nightingale Scholarship in April this year. Rebecca, big, big achikroiso, big, big welcome. Yeah. Um, please can I hand over to you to actually share with us your marvellous improvement story. Thank you very much and thank you for that lovely introduction and bilingually diolch um, fawr. So I'm just going to do, try and do the uh, I'm going to try and share my screen, basically, if it will allow me to. Yes. That's fine, Rebecca. Take your time. <laughs> okay. I'll, uh, uh, Rebecca, if you go down to the, sh the green share screen button at the bottom in the middle. Yeah. I pressed that, and then I'm getting a screen that's asking me to go into and then it should show you uh different windows that you can select to share so that will need they've all got big um triangles with an exclamation mark in so i think because it's saying unknown i don't know if there's some restrictions i can try and open it from my uh dropbox folder and see if that works if you just bear with me a second i do apologize no problem. If you're having issues, you can send it over to me. I, th I think the, the presentation has been sent over, hasn't it, Rebecca? It has been, yeah, yes. it has been sent over. I have made some adjustments, but I can skip past the slides that I've uh, made adjustments to and, and um, taken out. So okay. I should try It might be that if you try opening it so it's open on your screen. Yes. I've got two screens, which is probably causing. Um, an issue. What type of file is it? It's a PowerPoint. PowerPoint, okay. Um, do you have it open in PowerPoint at the moment? I do, yes. Okay, and when you um, open share screen, can you see the three tabs? I can, yeah. Oh, I've got it. It's working now for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't working a second ago. Um, Thank you, Rebecca. This is that you was you passed the first test that you were. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I am. I consider myself to be quite the uh, quite the technology person, so that's kind of thrown me through the ringer a little bit. So I do, I do apologise. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so if you go into slideshow mode, then I'll see yeah. the slide. Thank How's you. that? Are we able to, to see? Yeah. That's lovely, Becky. 
Great, so deep breath. Okay, so hello. And firstly, um, I'd like to thank you on two counts, really. And the first is to thank you for sponsoring my Florence Nightingale Foundation Scholarship. I cannot, I'm hoping that I can share with you today how much of an impact it's had in such, in just the six months or so that I've been doing it. It's just been phenomenal. Um, uh, it's really transformational. And secondly, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity and this platform today uh, to share my journey so far. And I really do hope it makes for interest in listening. As you've already said, I'm a senior nurse for quality improvement, actually, which involves leading on quality, uh, both assurance and improvement. Um, and integral uh, to my role is supporting the multi-professional teams to deliver um, improvement uh, improvements throughout the organization. Um, I've also got a really uh, keen interest in human factors, safety, science, behaviour and culture, which will probably explain the project that I've chosen as a part of my Florence Nightingale scholarship. So um, in terms of my improvement project, um, in my experience, both in a clinical space, so when I was a ward sister uh, and was working clinically, and as an improvement advisor in the last 10 years or, or, or more, um, I've experienced and observed the impact of culture and leadership, both good and bad, uh, and, the, and the impact on that in terms of particularly when we're trying to deliver improvement and trying to engage people's hearts and minds in, in doing different things, not just doing things differently. And then, so when I started to look into it a little bit more, I came across this term psychological safety. And I started to use that to articulate, uh, to, to articulate what it was that I was observing um, or not observing, if I'm going to be candid. Um, and I soon began to realize that I needed to understand this term better. So it's okay to use the term, but I felt um, that I needed to understand what the term actually meant and, and um, so that I could help others understand what it meant, because it feels like it started to be used an awful lot and not entirely sure everybody um, absolutely, absolutely understands it. And very often I'll see some sort of uh, rhetorical kind of assurance that there's psychological safety uh, for people to kind of speak up and take those into per personal risks um, when actually there isn't. Um, and so I started, I set about devouring all I could find uh, on psychological safety. And that's when I stumbled on the work of Amy Edmondson. And I've become a huge fan of her work ever since. Um, and it's underpinned a lot of my work in terms of my quality improvement project. So this slide just illustrates uh, kind of a very basic roadmap in terms of my quality improvement project. The first bit really was around my own self-development and, and developing expertise. I felt that I needed to develop a level of expertise to be able to, to teach others and engage others in psychological safety, to discover what we can do to try and <clears throat> uh, grow a climate of psychological safety in teams at the point of care. Um, so whilst I appreciate this is a huge undertaking, um, it's not something that's going to happen uh, overnight. I decided on psychological safety as the focus for my project for Florence and my Florence scholarship for two reasons really. One, you've got to start somewhere and change starts with, with me. Uh, and two, to hold myself accountable to actually trying to influence a change rather than just going around preaching about this thing called psychological safety. So um, I have started to move into the, I feel I've done a lot of that work around self-development. I've now started to move into that phase of raising the awareness of others. And I've started delivering uh, lots of sessions on psychological safety, uh, in, internal to the organization, but also externally. So Cardiff and Vale asked me to present uh, on a few occasions around psychological safety. Um, and the conversations they generated was um, really quite remarkable. And you get that feeling that people are really starting to understand what it is and wanting to do something about it. And I guess my current sticking point, if I'm honest, is about this next step, it's about step three. So it's about exploring those solutions with one area and testing. And, I, <clears throat> so I'm, and I'm going back and forth at the moment in terms of whether I do that in my own organization or if I consider doing it um, somewhere else. So that would be something that um, Kerry's uh, helping, with, helping me with. And I really appreciate uh, kind of that support and mentoring around how I take this forward. And obviously, um, as with any improvement project, the final step will be around evaluation and looking at how we can spread anything 
that we have done. So I didn't want to keep my knowledge to myself. And as a result, I've created something called a Padlet. I don't know if you've ever heard of Padlet uh, before. It's a really uh, f a fun software. Basically, it's like an electronic filing uh, system. So if you use this QR code, you'll be able to, uh, it'll direct you to my Padlet on all things psychological safety. And I've captured podcasts and videos and articles and their book recommendations in there. Um, and it's something, again, I've started sharing widely. I put it on the end of my presentations. So it's a great point of resource for anybody who is looking to uh, grow their um, knowledge base around psychological safety. And also it's a great opportunity for me to curate everything that I've learned so far to be able to keep going back to, um, to reflect on. And I think one of my crowning glory moments uh, is this. And so Amy Edmondson <laughs> herself came across uh, my Padlet uh, and she has um, endorsed it and shared it. Uh, and also Tom Gerty, who does a lot of, he does a weekly newsletter on psychological safety. Um, and it's been included in his uh, newsletter, which goes out to nearly 2000 people. So in terms of my impact as a leader and in terms of my impact around those conversations with psychological safety, it's just gone. I mean, it's gone global, really. If you think of Amy Edmondson, she's based in Harvard in the US. Um, and I've, I've, I've also um, reached out to Amy and spoken to her about my own development and she's given me some advice around that as well. She's just amazing and she's most recently been, uh, you know, uh, voted number one top 50 thinkers. But that's enough fangirling or I'll be here, I'll be here all day. But that was a, a huge moment for me. And when I look back, that's something, this all boils down to courage for me, courage and confidence, courage to challenge the status quo and confidence to have conversations with people that maybe six months ago I would have been like, oh, I can't possibly speak to that person, whether that's because of status power or, or, or whatever that might have been, or just my own insecurities. In the, in the six months that I've been doing Florence, I feel like I can reach out to anybody, talk to anybody, and the doors that is opening for me is just um, um, incredi incredible. And, you know, in terms of my development on a personal level, that can only mean great things for those that I work with um, and the patients that I care for as a result of the work that I do. And in terms of psychological safety and getting that right, it has huge benefits for both staff and patients alike. So um, having those candid conversations will mean that we'd be better at reporting incidences and hopefully there'll be some harm avoidance as a result of that, just, just to highlight uh, one, of the, one of the benefits really. Again, this is just some uh, kind of Twitter screenshots around some of the the work I've been doing, preaching around psychological safety and some of the feedback that I've been receiving. And I've even had a conversation with our new chief nursing officer for Wales, Sue, who is also a huge fan of uh, Amy Edmondson. We actually shared. And again, this isn't, I wouldn't, I don't know that I would have reached out to the CNO you know, previously, which is, which is interesting because I don't know that there's anything there in terms of permissions that were stopping me. I think it was me and, and, and myself as a leader and that lack of confidence and courage. Um, and just having that little bit of confidence and courage is, is just, um, I, I, I can't articulate it to be honest, it's just incredible in terms of things I'm able to achieve. It's opened um, lots of doors for me as a result. Uh, and I've grabbed every opportunity to grow and share um, yesterday I was presenting about a social movement initiative that I started called Hi-Fi Friday, which is all about staff well-being and trying to get people to, into a positive mindset um, at the end of the week and really think about five things that went well this week, because I think it's something that we often don't do in amongst all the pressures and everything else that, that we do. I've taken, well, I say pen to paper, but actually my fingertips to the to the keyboard and I've written my first blog is going to be published on the 12th of December. It's a little bit different, but then I am different um, and I celebrate uh, being different and I celebrate having a, a different outlook and a different view on things such as leadership. Um, and my blog is about five leadership lessons we can learn from Peter Pan. Um, 
One of the other things that's um, been phenomenal about the Florence Nightingale journey is the people that I've met along the way. And I've the cohort that I'm in is just incredible. We support each other, we hold each other up, we're there when we need each other, and it's just been amazing. And so I pitched um I pitched a uh, an idea to them around how we might be able to capture our journey and and share with others so kind of spread that learning so that it doesn't just remain with us and encourage others to go for this because I'd love to see more Florence Nightingale uh, applications coming from Wales and I've been reliably informed that we have had more applications this year I mean I'm not necessarily taking sole responsibility for that but I'd like to think I had a little bit of an impact I know that I have uh, mentored a couple of them who put applications in so what we decided to do as a group is we decided to start a podcast. Um, initially, we were going to do it just for ourselves, just to keep it to ourselves. And then we thought, you know what? Our motto has quickly become, let's go big. And so we've gone big. Um, and, we, and I am now the host and the founder of the Leadership Log podcast. Um, it's a podcast all about navigating everyday leadership. We've got three episodes that have been published to date. Uh, and in the first month of being live, we've had over 550 plays. Um, and just to put that into some sort of context for you in terms of impact, um, the average uh, podcast gets 27 plays. So we're actually sitting in the top 50% of podcasts. So that's a huge, huge achievement that I'm hugely uh, proud of myself and the team, or as I like to call us, the Log Pod crew. Um, and as you can see there, there are three different elements to it. There's a core leadership blog, which is about certain subjects. So we've done one on authentic leadership, which has been published. We've got two coming up, one on imposter syndrome and one on managing difficult conversations. They've been recorded and they're ready to be published in the coming weeks. And then that middle one is the reason why we did it in the first place. And that is all about us as scholars having an opportunity to share our journey as scholars uh, so that others can be hopefully inspired and motivated to apply for a scholarship themselves. And we've got uh, a couple of those that have been published. And then that last one is our homage to mentorship, because mentorship, leadership mentorship is hugely important, I think. Um, and again, that those are opportunities for you to listen to mentees and mentors having a conversation about the mentorship relationship. And our key values and principles that guide us in terms of this around connection and community, about kindness, about innovation, encouraging others, and about professionals, professionalism and maintaining that professional identity of nursing in particular. And again, just some feedback here, and you can see both uh, Charlotte McArdle, the, the new uh, deputy CNO for England, and the lovely Sue Tranker there, are following the podcast with interest and I've spoken to Sue and she's agreed to be on the podcast so watch out for that one and if any of you would like to be on the podcast please let me know I'd be more than more than happy to have you uh, have, interview any of you on the podcast and that first picture there for me was really quite a humbling experience to think that when somebody logs into their Spotify account to, to listen to a podcast there we are uh, shining bright uh, uh, for people to listen to has it's, it's just been amazing. The other thing that I've achieved as a result of increased confidence is, um, I don't know if you're aware, the Dragon's Heart Institute of uh, this CLIMB Wales, CLIMB International, CLIMB Wales Pro Leadership Programme. Uh, there were 30 uh, places um, and out of 200 uh, candidates, I was successful in getting one of those 30 places. And again, there's 12 months ago there's no way I, I would have thought I wasn't I wasn't any good I couldn't do this I'm not good enough uh, all those kind of imposter syndrome type things would have been coming in um, and I would have missed out on these opportunities um, and so uh, you know I'd encourage anybody really to get out of their own way and just put themselves forward and feel the fear and do it anyway no matter how uncomfortable it is until you push yourself outside of those comfort zones you know you won't understand uh, the phenomenal impact some of these things can have. So in rounding up my presentation <clears throat> I just put that up there because uh, this just uh, sums up my scholarship journey um, so far and I, I honestly can't thank you enough for um, investing in me and investing in my future and in investing in the future of the people that I work with um, and the patients that I serve so um, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening to me. Wow, Rebecca. That was absolutely inspirational. And as Pradolia de Gachi Dros Ben to Chris, I'm sure you'll agree there. That was a wonderful start to the board sort of today. Oh, it's put me off. I don't <laughs> I don't want to do the board now. I, Rebecca, yeah. if, I, if I opened this up for comments, right? It it's gonna go ballistic and we've got a meeting. And that's the <laughs> disappointment of this, right? What I wanted to say to you is, top job. Thank you. Right? Lovely presentation, but whatever you've got, bottle it and sell it, right? <laughs> and when you think about how under the hammer um, the front line of the NHS feels, mm. we need people like you reminding us of, you know, of, of the joy in actually caring. So, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Your, your personal journey is 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 fantastic to hear, and I'm I'm glad that in some way HEIW has played a little bit of a part in enabling you to do it. Yeah, I'll just finish there and say I'm not going to open it for questions, right? Because you just look at the body language around <laughs> around this Zoom, right? Well done, thank you ever so much, and I, I look forward to catching up with you soon. Lovely. Thank you very much. Diolch and Fawr. Enjoy the rest of your meeting. Don't Diolch forget, if you want to be on the podcast, let me know because we're looking. We, we, we will. We will. Great. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye. Lisa, that was really adequate. That was fantastic. You're on mute. What we want to do is share to you with the board and the public to the good work that the TTIW is actually supporting and developing and demonstrating what the outcomes are and actually how this does really impact on patient safety and care. Well, thank you for that. We've okay. got to move on to the meeting now, I'm afraid. So I'm going to call us, call us back, back, back to harsh reality for a minute. Um, I, I forgot to say that um, Rebecca is joining us today. Uh, Rebecca will be our um, interim finance director. And I have I've also want to say uh, hello to M Marie Claire Griffiths, who's also attending the meeting as the deputy planner. So, hi. Uh, so here we go. Can I go then please to the draft minutes of the, of the board, please? that was held on the 30th of September. I want to go first of all for, um, for accuracy. So bear with me, page one, page two, page three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and if 11. I something, can I something at the yes. bottom of page 10? Yeah. It's from the bottom. Yeah. It, where it, it says um, would be added. You just change, it should be should be added. I realize that that hasn't actually happened, but I think this sentiment is quite is wrong because not for me to. Should. Should be added. Thank you. Thank you. And the last page is page 11. I'm going on now to the, to, are you okay with the accuracy otherwise of those minutes? Yes. 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 I'm going to go now to the action log. Page one, I can see we've got completed actions. Are there any uncompleted actions, David? No, uh, all actions are complete or on today's agenda or on the forward work programme. Okay, so I want to go back to the minutes now for matters arising that are not covered by the action log or are not on today's agenda. So page one, two, three, four, five. I've got my hand up, Chris. Yep. Alex? Um, so on page, um, where was it? Sorry, page four, 
uh, the notes, we've got the primary care framework. So we confirm that um, we have submitted that to Welsh Government. And um, as the board are aware, we've also appointed Dorothy Edwards to help us over the next 12 to 15 months um, accelerate that really important work. Um, also, just to bring to the board's attention, um, the um, on page five, going to page six, we had a discussion about streamlining at the last meeting. Um, I think that um, we're aware we had um, some concerns raised with us with some of the professional bodies that we still haven't got that process right for some of those professions. So we are doing a piece of work between ourselves, the directors of therapies and Welsh Government to try and land a better approach for this year. And we'll update the education committee on that um, at their meeting in the next week or so. Um, so just wanted to flag that because it obviously related to that paper that we had at the last meeting. Okay, thank you. Page six, seven, eight, nine, 10 and 11. Are you happy for me to sign off the, these minutes as accurate? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm now going on to agenda item two, 2.1, which is the chair's report. And I, I know you all look forward to great joy and anticipation to this report. Um, it is very clear that we're in, in and amongst one of the most complex times in, in terms of health and social care. The, the pandemic still uh, um, is active. There are huge um, efforts going on in terms of vaccination programs for boosters. There's a, a, an enormous amount of work to deal with uh, delayed uh, treat, planned treatments. Urgent and emergency care is running hot. And we've got a workforce and a leadership, leadership that is really um, has had to stand up and be counted. Amongst all of that, we see people being trained, the educational processes are continuing and people's lives are very much affected whether you're uh, part of the caring or whether or not you're on the receiving end. People's lives are very much touched. I think this winter is probably going to be one of the most difficult periods for the NHS and social care to work through. But if it's difficult for them, it's difficult for the population and for patients. And I think we should remember that. I've had a really, really interesting uh, few weeks since the last board. And it's been a real pleasure to see um, lots of the projects that we're working on, what lots of the things that we're working on uh, come to fruition. I think supporting the workforce at present, the efforts to support the urgent and emergency care, and the efforts to support primary care, in particular, I draw attention to. Uh, the staff meeting I attended was really interesting, very well attended, and I thought showed well how our, as an organization, despite all that's going on, we can still focus on some real cultural things, things that are important to everybody. We had some really interesting stories from uh, Dr. Banar, for instance, on how to manage um, the vaccination uh, story. I, I also attended a Leaders in Healthcare conference. And at that conference, it was very clear that everywhere across the globe is struggling 
with services in the face of the pandemic, all in different phases. And recently we've seen um, in Austria and across Europe rises in cases. Um, yesterday, I sat with the digital team, or the day before I sat with the digital team, and I had an update on, on the digital uh, strategy, but also a really interesting briefing on um, cyber security. And I've shared that with, 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 with board members, and it's really worth reading. Um, it's, it's in terms of the independent members, um, we've, we've got the process to appoint two new members well underway now, and uh, we're planning to hold the um, interviews in the beginning of December. And I'll report back in January on, on, on the outcomes of that. But that comes to, um, to, to, to the last thing I want to talk about, and that's an individual, and that's Yves Young, who's been our director of finance. And um, Ivion is retiring at the end of December. So today is your last formal board, Ivion. How many boards have you done? Correct, Chairman. Sorry. How many board meetings have you done in your career? Oh, I haven't worked it out, Chair, but uh, I think it's over 28 years, really, as a, as a director. Really. Well, Clearly, today is uh, today is for me to say thank you for what you've done for HEIW, but I should also reflect on that's an awful lot of number of years that you've actually worked and supported the NHS. So I need to say thank you for that as well. And um, it's it's been um, you came into the organisation right at the beginning, and you've supported us getting to where we are now. And I'd like to put on record my gratitude and the board's gratitude for all your efforts and uh, your insights and experience. Thank you, Ayvion. Yeah, um, I, 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 I'm sure we'll have an opportunity in our, um, in our development session to say goodbye properly, but I, I wanted to put that on, on record in open meeting. Um, I'll just take you now to a chair's action this is a chair's action I took on the 5th of November, having um, consulted with two board members, uh, two independent board members, regarding um, increasing the numbers of core and specialty posts for medical training. Um, clearly, these are important times to get to get this over the line. Uh, to date, although I, saw, I, I sought um, uh, permission for 80, Today, we've managed the situation uh, to the point where we've um, had to take that action for 11, to support 11 training posts uh, at this moment. So I'm asking the board, please, to ratify that chair's action of the 5th of November. Can I have your approval, please? Yes. That's, yeah. that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, that's the end of my chair's report, and I'll now hand over to Alex. Oh, hello, Alex. You got your hand up? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, okay. I'm sorry. Right, I'm going to move on now to agenda item 2.2, which is the chief exec's report. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not going to... Um, cover any of the items that are already in the report, but I'm happy to take any questions on those. The only other item to add, which um, happened this week, which I think is important to note, is that we had the first meeting of the Healthcare Science Programme Board, which uh, Lisa is jointly chairing with um, Adrian Thomas um, from Betsy. And this is a really important uh, programme board that will oversee the work that transferred into us over the last 12 months from Welsh Government on developing um, or implementing the framework for healthcare science, which includes obviously a lot of work on developing the workforce, but also a focus on um, service improvement, hence why we have the joint um, leadership um, of the programme board between us and the health boards, and obviously Welsh Government colleagues are um, part of that as well. So um, 
thanks to Lisa for setting that up. I think um, we're really clear now on what the plans are and priorities are for developing um, that framework. Um, and that will obviously feature in our IMTP um, very clearly going forward as well. But other than that, I'm happy to take any questions. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Any questions for Alex? Can't see any hands up. Okay, we'll move on. Can I go to strategic matters, please? Section three, um, update paper, paper on the IMTP. Is that you, Nicola? <laughs> yes, Chair, thank you very much. Um, the board will remember that we agreed the framework for our plan in September. The NHS Wales planning framework has now been issued. Um, it was trailed heavily by Welsh Government officials previous to that, and there weren't any surprises in it. Um, but we have appended it for members to um, see. Um, uh, it hasn't changed um, the direction of our plan or the framework that we're planning in. Um, but obviously to note, uh, following on from the Chair and Chief Executive's report, that we are balancing the continued response to the pandemic with um, our more strategic work and our strategic plans. Uh, the planning framework, the um, Welsh Government timelines are to submit plans at the end of February, but on current assumptions and progress, we are still aiming um, for the board to have the final plan uh, to consider for approval at the end of January, at the January meeting. Um, with a further opportunity to discuss that in detail, the emerging plan at the board development session in December and collectively we can make a final decision there on that submission deadline. Um, the chief executive has to write an accountability letter on the 15th before the 15th of January as to whether we will be submitting an approval IMTP and again we can have that conversation then. We're in the active planning phase follow, following the agreement of the strategic framework and that's proceeding well. Um, I think we are shaping up to again have an exciting emergent plan and focused on delivery of many of the important programmes that we've already been shaping um, in, over the three years of our existence. Um, we have closed a number of areas, so we've completed a number of things in year um, and we have added a, a number of new areas some of which are listed in the paper as new, but are actually refocusing. There's about five of those that we're refocusing on, um, specifically being the education delivery system, future doctor, advanced practice, placements, and some of our cancer work. So those are areas we're already working on, but we've picked them out to give them more focus in the plan. And there's been a lot of helpful work already on the finance plan, and I'll hand over to Ivan in a minute to talk about that. Um, but we are in the process also of the engagement phase. So we are meeting with all other NHS organisations over the course of November. Um, there is a high level of engagement, um, planning to planning, but obviously workforce colleagues from organisations are joining many of those as well. It's fair to say the themes of the workforce strategy are coming out loud and clear, again, remains very relevant. But again, we'll give the board a more detailed update on that engagement in the session in December. Um, we've also engaged with our local partnership forum and the board will be aware that we're amending our engagement um, uh, processes um, and we'll be using those if agreed today to engage on the plan and before it's approved as well. Um, we also will be discussing the progress on the development of our plan and the emerging plan with Welsh Government colleagues at our JET meeting which is on the 7th of December. That's my introduction, but I'm just going to hand over to Ivan just to talk briefly about the finance plan as well. Yes, thank you, Nicola. Uh, just quickly then, um, colleagues will know that uh, we prepare a, a five-year plan to uh, accompany the, uh, the plan that uh, we submit to Welsh Government. The uh, trajectory for that plan is for increased growth in HRW's uh, resources. Uh, just to actually note the growth that um, when I joined HRW uh, a couple of years ago, our budget was uh, somewhere around 215 million. This year it's 285, which is a very substantial growth in our resources. And we're planning that next year 
uh, should actually result in a, another 30 million pounds growth in the annual spend of HIW. And that five-year trajectory that we're working through sees that growth uh, car carrying on because of the additional commissioning activity that we're undertaking. In actually working out the financial plan, uh, colleagues will know that uh, the vast bulk uh, of the plan for a financial point of view is based on the education and training plan that's been submitted to Welsh Government. That makes up the vast bulk of that £30 million increase that we uh, that's the draft plan that we have for next year. Uh, that actually shows uh, uh, that that growth. So of that, um, all of it would be the education and training plan com uh, commitment, and also the new growth that we've received from Welsh government in the confirmation in the last uh, month or so that we will have our core infrastructure funded and the uh, leadership and development programme as well. So they have been built into the plan and uh, all of that now is, will be available to actually include when the, the full plan comes before the board. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Chair. Happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you, um, uh, Avion. Any, uh, Jill? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I couldn't see my hand for a minute, but I can see it now, so it's OK. Um, thank you, Nicola, and thank you, Avion. Um, I, I was a bit um, confused, I think, when I when I read this, because I've lost track now of the years that, that and the plan and what, what exactly... Um, that we're compiling. So can, can you just confirm, we, we had our plan approved obviously for 21-22, but this guidance that's attached appears to refer to 21-22, not 22-25. And, and I'm just a bit confused by that because obviously we're now preparing the 22-23 plan, I assume. Are we preparing a three-year plan with a more detailed one-year plan. Yeah, Alex is nodding. Yeah, as I thought that was the case. So why is the guidance 21-22? Or have I dreamt all that? It's in the, it, it's attached to the papers. Yeah. It's in the letter, Chris, I think, isn't it? Yeah. From the Welsh Government, it actually says 21-22. So I'm Is confused. that what you mean, Jill? Yeah, I'm totally confused. And the attachment is for 21-22, which doesn't appear to be 22-25 guidance. So apologies, Chair. There appears to have been a mistake in the appendix. So the appendix isn't the planning framework for 22-25, to 25, as the title suggests. <clears throat> so we will circulate that to members. Um, oh, thank goodness, it's not me. <laughs> yeah, apologies. So, so, so the, the appendix is the incorrect appendix, yeah? Yeah, appendix two is not correct. Okay, we, we will not only need to circulate it to members, we will need to put the correct papers on the website. Noted, Chair. And, and in the minutes of this meeting. Noted, and we will do that. Thank okay. you. Can, can you pick that up as a key action, David, to make sure that happens? Okay. Of course. Right. Any other any other comments or questions, Jill? Now, now, now that the confusion has been cleared. No, I think I think Alex nodding um, confirmed my understanding, so I'm okay now. Thank you. Okay. So if I can, if I can just confirm that. So we are um, developing a three-year plan with obviously firmer plans for the first year. So that can be noted. Yes. Okay. Jill. Ah, oh, so, sorry, Ruth. Um. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Well, I, I'm. I, I read the paper. I hadn't picked up that point. So. Um. Yeah. Um. Um. Thank you to to Jill. But um, I just wanted to express a sort of. It's just a feeling about the way we use the word delivery. 
Um, because obviously, you know, a plan is a plan and it's no good without the other half of it. But in the paper, I'm left, it talks, it talks quite a lot about delivery and I'm wondering about what we're delivering. Are we delivering the plan? Are we delivering the actions that the plan um, uh, contains or are we delivering outcomes? So it, it's, um, it's a thought more than, more than anything and it's not a criticism, it's uh, just something to, to bear in mind. Uh, I, I just um, have a, a sinking feeling about plans which become plans in their own right and don't actually produce anything. I know this is nowhere near that. I'm just saying I think we need to be very clear about what we're delivering. Do you want to come back on that, Nicola or Alex? Yeah, to reassure Ruth, um, we're absolutely on that page. Um, and I think the words that we used in our planning workshop last, was, last week was, we don't want a plan full of plans to deliver plans. Um, you know, this is about what we're going to achieve, what's the impact, how we support in the system, and um, really measuring our contribution in those terms. Um, uh, and the plan is a vehicle to help us deliver that and achieve that not the be all and end all. And I think there is a, um, you know, there is a, um, a tendency sometimes for organisations to get over-focused on a plan. Yeah. You know, what we're really conscious of is, is actually the process of planning is really, really helpful because um, it makes people think, it makes people think about the future, it makes people connect what they're doing, it makes people clear on their objectives, um, but actually, you know, if it doesn't lead to action um, and if it isn't um, clear enough, um, suitable enough for our organisation, then it won't be of any use. And so you know, um, we're really clear on that. This plan is for us to make clear on what we're contributing and how, how we can have an impact. Um, and, and that's the most important thing. So I, I absolutely, I'm with you on that, Ruth. It's always my sort of... Well, yeah, thank you. That's that's really reassuring. I, I could just urge us to make sure that it comes through in the, you know, when we're talking about delivery, because it, for me, it doesn't come through clearly in the paper. I'm sure that it's in your hearts and, you know, minds and spirits and all the rest of it, but it, it just communicating that. That's really helpful feedback. Thank you. I, th I think you might want to think about that, Nicola, in terms of, of, of some of the language and also the, the, the way that it's presented. Okay, I, I know we're stuck sometimes in the way that the government asks us to present these things, but that's no reason why we shouldn't put a version that we understand which connects that delivery and outcome. Okay, right. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, oh, Heidi. And yes, then can I ask, are we bringing this back to another board meeting with the correct papers? Thank you. Uh, Sorry, I, I nodded and I didn't mean to nod. Um, we will give you the correct papers. We are bringing this discussion back to the board development session in December to have an hour on discussing the content of the plan. So, thank uh, you. Great. Okay. And um, Tina? Thanks, Chair. Um, I thought there were some really interesting points within the paper and a couple of points I just wondered about is in relation to item six, where there's the lining of the IMTP with the education training plan and a lessons learned paper that the um, execs will be receiving in November, December time. Given that the, the current um, uh, open and frank discussions that are being raised with regards to vacancies across the health service and the challenges that there are, we've also in education committee um, raise concerns over the availability of placements and I think it would be useful to look at um, a little bit more detail about how placements actually control the commissions and going forward the digital agenda so when we're talking about lessons learned are we going to look at potential solutions going forward for the um, 22 to 25 year plan based on that because that's going to be really really difficult um, given that we're asked to train a lot of people, but we might not necessarily have the placements, but if we can accentuate the digital stuff and the um, way in which we're 
seeking to improve the numbers we can get through, it would be helpful. And I noticed that um, the NMC are also talking about um, different ways of gaining placements this morning. So the involvement of the regulators and the restrictions that we have and how that might impact on our lessons learned going forward will be helpful, Chair. Thanks. Okay. Useful points there, Alex. Yeah, I mean, Tina's raised a really, really important point, um, which was, um, as the board is aware, a, a constraint to some extent on some of the aspects of the education and training plan that we've just put into Welsh Government. Um, so in Lisa's team, we've got Simon Cassidy now, who's head of clinical placement development, who's looking at this both from um, a quality and a, a capacity perspective. Um, you will know that we've already placed um, care home education facilitators in the system to look at how we open up placement capacity in that part of the sector. And we're also um, unpicking this issue through our work on the primary and community education and training framework. So there's a lot of work going on to help inform how we can take forward the education and training in Wales with that not being such an absolute constraint um, in the future. And um, for those of you who um, listened to the Senate discussion, that was obviously a key question in the Senate as well, in terms of you know what innovative approaches can we take? And as you say, you know, we've got to do that in conjunction with our partners in terms of health boards um, and the NHS and also uh, regulated professional bodies and and certainly over the course of the next um, few months, we hope to be, you know, raising more of those conversations to get some progress on that. Thanks, Alex, because that's very, very helpful. A communication plan, um, realistically, would be very helpful because we, it can be misleading to think that the NHS is not responding as best it can. But there are, you know, things take time and training does take three to five years from this profession. So thanks. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Lisa? Yes, and thank you, Tina, Aji, for raising this. Aji, as you quite rightly, as you reported, to clinical placements underpins everything Aji, that we do, and the outcome of our good quality education that she relies on that heavily. I'm really pleased to actually report, really, Aji, that we've had the conversations with um, directors of nursing and the chief nursing officer already on the importance of the clinical placement activity. So we are looking at Aji, are we utilising our current clinical placement Aji, activity? Um, effectively and efficiently and then as well as that exploring what other opportunities there are and other settings that we can create that as well. I'm also pleased to say that we are actually taking this forward on a multi-professional basis as well because as you can imagine actually the standards of actually a clinical placement the standards should apply across all our professions so therefore we are exploring actually how sort of we can create multi-professional clinical placements which creates opportunity for not just nurses but actually all our professions and that is an exciting thing that we are going to take forward and is being well received by the system already so I'm fairly confident that we've got the support in order to take this work forward but it is a key piece of work as you described thank you Tina. Um, Posh. Thank you along similar lines um, we're we're all uh, in the same place about encouraging clinical placements and looking at innovation and we mustn't forget the role of uh, uh, our digital colleagues and resources and simulation as part of that because many of the curricula are changing in a way that uh, you can have virtual clinical placements uh, in, in a different way to what has traditionally been happening. And the multi-professional aspect is, you know, that there are economies of scale. If you have one person in a placement, having another person, particularly of another profession, can be quite beneficial to have more than one profession uh, having a placement in the same time. And equally, I remember when I was in my training that um, more junior doctors would be coming to me for teaching. So, you know, the one placement can actually facilitate another placement and particularly in the multi-professional angle. So just a few things that we're thinking about uh, from a medical side and um, in my conversations with Simon Cassidy, that, that that's that the direction that we're going. So we are looking at all of the um, options that are available to to be innovative and to be um, and to be uh, collective. It, it's, it strikes me that uh, creating the cap, cap, capacity and capability uh, to train will become more and more important over the next two to three years 
and given given the uh, the present workforce uh, issues, and I don't think we should underestimate the uh, provision of services to train and uh, support postgraduate uh, training as well. I think those are uh, not just the undergraduate uh, lines on these things. So. Um, if there are no other questions, I think, Nicola, you've, we've had a discussion this morning. There's some useful points, I think, and we look forward to the session in the, um, in the development session. I think, for me, one of the key points that's come from this morning is the language we use and the determination to deliver outcomes, which we need to um, amplify in the in the uh, as the iterations of the IMTP go, go forward and I think the work between the digital assets that we might be able to use in terms of managing uh, placements in a multi it's multi complex but but I think the ability to manage placements pr appropriately and organize capacity is going to become key to delivering uh, the outcomes in that in those IMTPs. So, thank you for that. I'm now going to move on to agenda item 3.2, which is the update on development of the strategic workforce plan for mental health. Who's leading on this one? Uh, Alex. Me. Apologies. I'm just um, opening my paper. Um, so yeah, I thought it was really important um, just to provide the board with uh, an update on where we are with this uh, really exciting piece of work on the uh, mental health workforce plan to go with together for mental health. Um, so the report just sets out where we are in process terms, um, both with the plan, but also with some of the um, immediate priorities that um, the team, Lisa's team actually have been leading on, which have got a, a particular education focus. Um, but um, with the, the area that I've been more involved with is the development of the strategic workforce plan, because this is the first time we've really been um, able to see how the workforce strategy can help us dissect and what the workforce plan needs to look like for um, a service area. Um, so we are um, getting to the really important point of that now where the plan is becoming formed. We've got an actual a joint session with Social Care Wales on the 16th. Yeah, um, and so this will be one of the items that we will discuss then. So in terms of how that's shaping up, there will be an opportunity for the board to um, get involved in that conversation there with colleagues in Social Care Wales, because obviously as a joint endeavour, and um, I did just share with the board um, anyway yesterday for information the slides that um, we've been discussing at the ministerial board, which were hot off the press, really. And obviously, uh, that's one of the reasons why they weren't attached to the paper, really. So, um, so yeah, so I just wanted to register that with the board um, and um, flag that up for um, a future discussion. But I'm happy to take any questions on any of that today. Um, and I'm sure colleagues will help me if there are any questions about the education components, which I'm probably less an expert in. Okay, can I open this up for com uh, for questions or comments? John, is is there an awareness of this in the? Oh, there you are, John. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was the. I mean, you're, you're going to say, is there an awareness in the vice chairs group, Chris? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the comment I wanted to make. Actually, um, Angie Oliver came to make a presentation on this at the last meeting of the vice chairs group, and it was very much welcome. The approach was, was really supported. But the other point is that there are significant demands in the mental health and from mental health patients at the moment, both in adults and children. And uh, so we're pleased to see the mention in the report of what immediate things we can do as HEIW. And so as Alex says, we're doing the strategic plan, but we're also looking at some of the more uh, as I say, immediate priorities that we can help the service with. So both of those aspects were very much welcomed by the vice chairs and they've asked to be kept in the stakeholder loop. So as the, as the strategic plan develops, I've asked Angie to come back and do further presentations, which she will do. So does that answer your questions, Chris? Yeah, yeah. I, I just think it's very important that we sh this is seen across the partners. 
in 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 health and social care. Yeah. Alex, do you want to come back in? Yeah, no, sorry, I, I should have said um, that obviously we have got um, a communications plan that is trying to be all encompassing now in terms of um, the people that we've engaged along the way, because we did start this off, the board will remember from the briefing session we had back in the spring with um, an engagement exercise last autumn, um, which um, included um, a whole range of different people and we produced a, a conference report from that. There have been then specific things along the way with different professional groups, voluntary sector, etc. And clearly now, as we get into the point where we're starting to articulate what might be in the plan, um, that engagement and communication will continue to be really important. So the approach that we're trying to take is the same really as the workforce strategy, where we'll, we'll twin up with colleagues from Social Care Wales and try and get to as many groups as possible, as well as obviously provide um, a draft document um, that will be available during January and February for comment. Um, and obviously the vice chair's group is important. And obviously the um, deputy minister is also keeping a very close eye on that. And that was the presentation I was given yesterday because I sat on the ministerial oversight board. Um, and again, a range of stakeholders there. And there is a lot of support for, um, you know, not just seeing this as a sort of um, how many doctors and nurses do we need, which is clearly an important part of the discussion, but actually, in the true spirit of the workforce strategy, what do we really need to get a sustainable workforce with engaged, motivated, well skilled staff um, for the future um, that meets the need of the system and the emphasis on sort of beyond the statutory and um, um, definition of mental health services coming through loud and clear in those conversations that this is definitely about looking at that wider system and looking at the role of um, people outside of those um, traditional professional groups to see how we can support and flex the workforce and the capacity we need to meet you know, what is a growing demand really for mental health care and how we can make sure that we focus on prevention and upstream work. So there's a lot of support, a lot of alignment, a lot of consensus on what we need to do. Um, and I think you know, it's going to be a really exciting piece of work for us to really help contribute to that. Thanks, Alex. Jill? Yeah, I think actually, Chair, Alex just about answered um, my question. I was going to ask about the emphasis on upstream and prevention and the multi-professional um, and others um, being included in it. So, so I think as long as there is a huge, because it's, it's becoming very, very, very obvious that this is a major issue um, post COVID, um, particularly for, for young people. So, so I think anything that we can do that would um, help the system in terms of the upstream work is, is pretty critical because at the moment we're firefighting the high end stuff. So, so thank you, Alex. You, I think you answered it really. Okay, uh, Tina. Thanks, thanks, Alex. Um, I guess it's just um, asking for, um, well, it's probably a question out with the norm, but I just wonder whether the education establishments and schools are also around the table. I know that, you know, you have a school nursing workforce, but the issue around this is how much teachers um, in um, the whole educational establishment should be paying part of this um, because prevention, to some extent, Jill's mentioned a bit of it, but I just wonder whether there is that wider engagement with um, schools as well as universities, particularly in mental health, rather than just in le providing lectures and that the responsibility and how we lie in how that lies in prevention. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely, Tina. I think that's the. Um, we, we need to we, we did have some of that engagement at the start as we're developing and shaping the actions it's clearly lying towards that part of the wider system I think that will um inform some of the engagement that now needs to happen on how we really land a plan that does have actions that are supported by sectors outside of the ones that we can really speak on behalf of um and certainly education is a key one um that, that clearly comes through for the reasons that you've just articulated so um, we haven't done a huge amount of engagement yet on those areas, but that will certainly be part of the plan for the next couple of months um, as we 
as we've identified that those are really probably some of the critical areas that we need to put in the plan. Uh, Thanks, Chair. Heidi? Thank you. For, forgive me, I'm not really going to articulate this very well, I, I don't think, but if, if in, in order to understand an organisation um, like, for example, mental health, it, my understanding is it's quite common to bring them in or invite representatives to come to board meetings and to come to um, workshops and things to present. Um, and there, I think there tends to be a, a tendency for those representatives to um, tell the positives. And I wonder whether there is room for actually almost a, 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 an opposite way. So um, we go into those areas and actually see what it's like. I remember Julie coming into the general practice I was working in and just sort of seeing it, absorbing it and, and understanding it from that perspective so that you actually see what the walk in the walk and not just talking the talk. Does that make sense? Who are you, who are you talking about clearly there, Heidi? I'm just wondering whether um, when we, we're trying to understand the workforce requirements of an area and we, in order to do that, whether we're actually seeing what is required at base level or whether we are hearing what is required from those representatives, from those organisations. So actually going in and seeing how things are working. An example is, um, for example, the ND service that I work within, where we have 800, 900 children on a waiting list that's two years. And arguably we would say, and our representatives might well say, we need more staff, but actually coming in and looking and shining a light on the service, there are efficiencies that could be made that don't involve more staff and do we go in at that level or is anybody going in at that level and looking at those kind of changes that would influence the workforce that we actually need. Thanks Heidi, I understand it a lot better. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, there are a lot of um, different parts of the NHS that are focused on exactly what you've just described, really, which is around that kind of improvement process, um, which means getting a better service for the service users, but also, as you say, improving efficiency, supporting it with digital technology and all of those other aspects. And that's certainly, um, it was in fact a theme that came up yesterday at the Ministerial Board as well, to make sure that we are focusing that in. I don't think that's necessary for us to do, and I think that would be quite practically um, difficult, but we do need to make sure that we are asking those questions. And it's all part of how we get that proven in practice workforce. Um, as you say, that we're not wasting expertise and skills and that we are um, making the best use of what we've got. So um, we are gonna be thinking about how we really do build in some of those considerations into what we're doing and to talk to people like, Improvement Cymru and the delivery units around the work that they may have already done with, with, with mental health services across the board. So yeah, and it's a really good point. Thank you. Lisa? Is you on mute? You're on mute, Lisa. Okay. Thank you. Um, sorry, I couldn't take it off there. Um, basically, actually, this is quite a complex arena because actually, I think we all need to understand, and all the points are very, very valid, is basically mental health actually, is everybody's business, and it does transcend actually, from sort of right actually, in the community right through to our specialist services. You know, what we can actually evidence is actually, how we've actually moved actually, in terms of um, the education of our workforce. No longer actually, are we actually just seeing mental health as actually, the mental health services business. We have built in actually to all our education programs actually how our professionals actually assess actually individuals holistically in other words they consider the mental health of those people actually appropriately and then as appropriate refer to where it's needed but actually picking up on what tina was saying about actually you know what education is doing i know there's a vast amount of work actually being under undertaken actually with um schools because they obviously are sort of seeing actually the impact of mental health issues actually in the community and there is a work a lot of work going on there but it's actually how we dovetail this 
um, and is actually really understanding which areas of this is actually relevant to the secondary mental health services, the primary mental health services, and what then is actually everybody's business, because actually everybody is taking a part to play in this, including our voluntary care sector, and we mustn't actually forget actually all the good work at our charities and voluntary agencies do to actually sort of improve this as well. So this is quite a large arena, and as Alex says, actually it is about that interface. We can't take it all because actually others actually are taking responsibility in this as well. But we are making sure that our education programmes are becoming more holistic um, in addressing mental health issues as well as the physical health issues across the board. Thank, thanks, Lisa. Uh, my observation, Alex, is that, that this is a matter of real interest to the board. And, uh, you know, it's a, this is a very big, chunky, um, and dare I say it, it's in the limelight. It's of the time, it's come of time now. I think, for me, I think we need to make sure we've got the right resources to make this sing, to make this work. And, um, you know, to support the work that you're doing, um, you know, it, it, I think the board would welcome if you need more resource, if you need, need, need the board to consider how to make this as effective as possible and get it in get it uh, completed properly and in in a good time uh, i think that would we we'd welcome that the other point is that in the independent members discussions earlier on this morning it was very clear was prevention is better than cure and um, anything we could be doing to support the preventative agenda in terms of mental health um, I, I think there's a, a role to play about digital, the use of digital communications, that perhaps it's about educating people how to use social media properly, particularly young people and maybe young parents. I, I, I think there, there's some not so obvious stuffs about the professional workforce that perhaps we, we might be able to have an influence, if not actually do anything ourselves. So, can you come back to us if you if you need any more resource, Alex? Okay. So, I think that was a good discussion, and we've been asked we've been asked to note this just for information. But I think there was some good ideas there. So, we move now on now to agenda item three point three. Briefing on the National Quality and Safety Framework. Thank, thank you, Chair. The, um, th this has already been presented previously at Education Committee and at a board development session, so I, I won't go over the, uh, the, the detail of this. But um, recently, Welsh Government published uh, this document, um, a new reporting of quality supersede and what's of importance to us is it supersedes the annual quality statement so um there's a huge number of uh, range of actions relating to this that have been incorporated into this uh, requirement and and covid-19 has been added to that as um uh, as it is now a really important part of our work um th the importance of this was also to reduce variation in quality uh, in, in all of our NHS organisations. The board will be aware that we've commenced a programme of work to develop an integrated quality framework within HEIW that is based on largely on the, the way that we, um, so let me move my camera, the, the, the way that we, um, uh, we manage quality in the medical section. And we are looking to disseminate those standards that we Put, uh, we have there across all areas of of HEIW. Um, so the purpose of this board of this uh, bringing this to the board is to just let you know what the implications are uh, to us. So if you go through the framework actions, nearly all of the actions I won't go through them individually have have some implication for us in HEIW. Uh, only one is is. Is, is not something that is directly related to us. So we will be taking on board all of those actions and how they uh, impact on us. And we'll engage with the national governance arrangements that um, are required of us. And they're detailed in section three. Uh, 
Um, uh, I was in the YouTube Canada workshops with David, and I know that they have now finished. And um, my colleagues have been going to uh, uh, other other groups. So I bring this really to uh, to recommend the board that you note this that that this has been published, and it replaces the annual quality statement and. There will be plenty of work for us to do in in relation to this from a from a quality management framework, particularly in relation to students, trainees, and learner experience. And to note that we are fully engaged with the process. So I'll stop there and um, invite any comments. Lisa, you've got your hand up. Okay. Any comments or questions on this? Can't see any. How are we going to keep track of all of these actions, Hush? Um, good so question. <laughs> I mean, it sounds to me, I mean, there's a huge list of things here. Yeah. How, how are we going to be assured that we are playing our part appropriately? Um. Well, I think we just got to look at the list of actions and make sure that we're satisfying them from our perspective. And uh, we've got a list of implications for that. Um, in We will have to do an annual response to this to Welsh Government because we don't have to do the annual quality statement any longer. So I think that'll give us the discipline to report on, on what we're doing in, in those individual areas. So uh, I would say that's probably how the cycle will work. And for it to go to be submitted, it will have to go to exec team. It'll have to come to board as well in that in that manner. And to the education and quality. And to the education committee. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so Ruth, uh, you do you want to come in there? Uh, only just a very trivial point on action. I haven't got my paper in front of me because I can't do both on them. But on action um, three, which is about medical examiners. Yeah. Um, there's a wording that says. Um, um, paraphrasing out, um, trainees to um, re re require an understanding. I just wonder if that's supposed to be acquire. It's at the bottom. Action of three. Oh, it's action five, sorry. Oh, sorry. Action five. Three. Mortality reviews and re uh, yeah, well, it could be either. Um, they do require to understand. It's it's a requirement for them to understand how the medical examiner system works. Oh, okay. I'm but it could it could be acquired too. Yeah, that's a fair comment. Okay, so, so so Ruth, this seems to be heading towards the education and quality subcommittee for assurance. It, I, I'd be interested to see how you develop how the uh, assurance mechanisms developed on this, okay. uh, so that it's not just about the report; it's about showing progress and being assured there is progress. So, well, we'll be very happy to keep tabs on this. We've already seen it once in education committee, and we'll be continuing to to watch its progress as um, as uh, you know it needs to be delivered. Okay. Could could I say? Uh, Chair, that um, the, the next education committee is, is not far away and um, we are trying to incorporate some of these things into our routine reporting. I, th I think, uh, I, I hope that uh, Ruth and Tina will be pleased to see the, um, the latest version of the medical report, which isn't simply about um, which areas are in, are in enhanced monitoring, but um, a quality flavor to the whole report more than than has been there before so uh so, so that's the way we're trying to develop our reporting to education committee okay so um if there are no other comments or questions we've been we've been asked to note the publication of 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 the national quality and safety framework note that the current annual quality statement requirement will be replaced when when does that come into being I, I think it already has. This this has replaced the annual quality statement. So it has replaced it. So when yeah. when is the next one due? So the annual quality statement is normally uh, provided at the end, so post April of the year just gone by. Right. So this will, I presume, um, yeah. follow can, the can same I just, lines. 
can just assist with that with our crew. So uh, we've had guidance from Welsh Government that usually there would be a separate annual quality statement, uh, but this year, as was the case last year, the advice is that it will be incorporated as, as part of the annual report. So we'll include references to quality within, within that report rather than having a separate annual quality statement. Uh, and the requirements around the new annual report will come into effect in the next month. Sure. Okay, so is that for this coming April, post this April or April 2023? You're querying when the new requirements will come in? Yes. Uh, the, the latter. Okay. Uh, no, not, no, it'd be 2022 for this year, won't it? It's, it's the latter was 2023 was what Chris suggested. So. Which, is the, which would be the next financial year. Can you clarify? We'll clarify, yeah. When, when is this got to be reported in this format? Is it, is it post April 22 or post April 23? It's post April 22 is my understanding, but we'll get back to it. Okay. All right. Note that the national work with will inform and shape key aspects of the HIW quality management framework, including student training and learner experience. So, all right, and then note the full engagement of HEIW in this work. Well, this, this is quite a chunky thing. And when we were talking about outcomes later, earlier, this is probably at the heart of the outcome discussion. Will we have to change the way that we are aiming the outcomes from our various projects under the IMTP and frame them in these terms? Um, I think it's a bit of wait and see, really. Um, am I muted? No, uh, I think we have to wait and see. The um, I, th I think we already do a lot of this within HIW. Um, so I think it'll be a, a question of dovetailing what and overlapping what we already do with, with the reporting systems. Mm. Um, they're be already based on a, a quality type framework for, for the GMC and, and the GDC. So I think that um, it, it hopefully won't be a big step. Okay, Nicola. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of our big pieces of work on the performance framework in 2022-23 will be around our quality measures and our quality outcomes. Um, and we, that's our priority for the work programme for that for next year. And we've deliberately sort of pitched it then because obviously we're doing the work on our own quality management framework, which, which will include measurement. And the work on that is obviously done within the context of the national quality framework. So it's, 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 it quality and, it's quality and safety. Yeah, so we will be that's, tied. That's the bit that's... That. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and noted that, but we will be tying it all together through to the okay. framework. All right, thank you. Can I ask we go on to agenda item 3.4, proposal of the HAW stakeholder reference group. Okay, just what I'm Kadiri, but I'm sure I'm going to come back. But he's Papur and Hon and Galvina, who made a do with the board. Or I'm Kevin Deer, my Papur and Han or Adnewyad, Ne Adelogiad, or in Guithgarede, Kamathrebi, Ak and Gasusti are all Covid. A hint in Kelly Gunnig at the Inbordney and Cray Group, Kaverio, Handeliad, and a stakeholder reference group, or SRG. Uh, ac mae Cilch Gorchwyl yr SRG wedi atodi yn uh, atodiad fydd un. Uh, o ran i bwrdd pas, pas yr SRG fydd cyfnogu'r bwrdd gyda chyngor a thrafodaeth a draws uh, ystod sydd y geithau ag eich. Um, ac o ran um, edrych uh, ar y grŵp yma, da ni wedi bod yn edrych um, ac yn adlygu modelau sy'n bodoli sydd fewn i cyrff eraill sydd fewn i'r gwasanaeth uh, iechyd. Um, disgwylir y bydd yr SRG uh, yn gwella uh, effeithiolrwydd um, agig o ran cysylltu gyda ein handeiliad um, uh, ac mae'n bwysig nodi bydd sefydlu'r SRG yn disodlu'r gofyn a'r hyn o bryd am y grŵp uh, cynghori ag addysg, Education Advisory Group, yr EAG, 
um, ac uh, sydd yn uh, isbwyllgor uh, i'r pwyllgor addysg. Uh, felly i gloi, yn ein gofni i'r bwrdd i gefnogi, gefnogi sefydlu'r grŵp cyfeirio rhanddeiliad, uh, SRG, yn hyd ar cylch gorchwyl sydd yn hwn yn absodiad un, uh, ac yn ail bod y SRG yn disodlu rôl cyfredol yr EAG, a bod yr EAG y hyn yn cael ei ddyddymu. Uh, diolch y dyddyd. Diolch dafydd. Right, so are there any questions or comments to be made? Ruth? Just to say, um, Chair, I, I support this um, proposal. I think it will be a, a very positive step. And um, I think as far as I'm concerned, the outline, pa the pa paper is, is, is very satisfactory. Um, so. Thanks, Ruth. I, th I think the partnership bit and the stakeholder bit of our organization is really important. Um, taking people along and listening carefully to people's views, I think is really, uh, really a very important thing that we do. John? I just wanted to say, yes, I support this chair to, in um, following on from what Ruth said. I mean, when I was served on a local health board, this was the model that we had and it was very effective. So I would certainly support this. I think it's a good idea. Thank you, John. Okay, so if there are no other comments, I'm asking the, the board to approve the establishment of the HEIW stakeholder reference group together with the terms of reference attached as appendix one. Can I ask your approval, please? Yes. yes. And um, that the SRG replace the current role of the Education Advisory Group and that the EAG be disbanded. Can I ask your approval? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Um, I'm now moving on to part four, uh, which is governance, performance and assurance. And the first item, 4.1, quarterly integrated performance report. Nicola. Thank you, Chair. You're having a busy morning this morning, Nicola. I know. Yeah, it's all good stuff. Thank you um, for uh, introducing the paper. So um, this is our quarterly re quarter two report, performance report, but we have given it a midyear flavour um, to sort of wrap the midyear together because we will be using it for support and information for our jet as as I previously said, that's on the 7th of December, but also thought that would be useful for the board as well. Um, the report shows that there is the organisation and all our staff are making good progress with the delivery of our objectives and actions that we laid out in our annual plan for this year. And the progress is very similar to that we reported in quarter one. Um, and there are many highlights and developments and areas that we have delivered um, tangible differences um, over the course of the first half of the year as outlined in the paper. Um, on a couple of areas, so the report uh, describes the recruitment rates as at September, which obviously for some areas is a critical point of the year, um, and recruitment rates are good for medicine, dentistry and health professional education. And, and just for the board to note, that in dentistry particularly, that required a, a great deal of significant extra work from our team because of the disruption to undergraduate education and taking those students through into their postgraduate training as a result of the pandemic. In HPE, uh, health professional education, sorry, um, this is the highest recruitment rate at the September midpoint uh, point of year that we've seen for the last 10 years. Um, we're not sure why that is, but it could be as a result of the pandemic and obviously um, the desire to work in health and social care potentially. Um, uh, there is a mixed picture on pharmacy. So on we haven't in either of the two cohorts with the um, new postgraduate training scheme filled the 160 places, but of those that, have, that we have filled and taken through, and um, the pass rate is the highest in the UK, which we're very pleased about. Um, and obviously, uh, it's a core part of our revised offer um, on education training for pharmacists. 
Um, the report is a busy report because it also um, provides the annual picture for progression with medical trainees. So the um, annual reviews are reported in this report. Um, the picture is it's that progression is not as disrupted as this point of last year, but the COVID impact can still be seen in the results. With some cumulative issues in some specialties, as you can imagine, surgery particularly, um, which we are managing on an individual basis with trainees, but we're also tracking the financial consequences of that if it requires extensions to individuals' training. Um, with student experience, again, a busy uh, time of year, the student national student surveys uh, being published. Um, generally, no causes for concern, apart from one area, particularly with midwifery in a, in a single university, which has been escalated appropriately as part of the commissioning process. Um, and I'm sure will be a topic of conversation at the Education Quality and Commissioning Committee. Um, with regard to quality management, um, one area to, to highlight, which is the reconfiguration of services in an iron Bevan and the recent uh, Royal College of Physicians report. Um, we were already um, managing, uh, that was an area that was under management from the medical side with us already. Doesn't meet the criteria for enhanced monitoring, but a specific oversight group has been established to ensure that um, the improvements are made as planned. So a busy report at this mid-year point for various reasons to do with the um, annual reporting cycles and happy to take any comments or questions. Okay, well, thank you for that report, Nicola. Um, any comments or questions? John? Thanks, Nicola, I welcome the report. There's a lot of good progress there and I think we can be very proud of the progress we're making. Also, particularly, um, enthusiastic about your internal performance management group so that the whole process becomes much more embedded. And I know this is one of the things we talked about in the past, isn't it? Can I ask a question on Appendix 1, page 3? And if you look there, about nearly at the bottom, there's a comprehensive service evaluation about a scheme in social care called CHEF. We spotted that one. Yeah. And I know that we are trying to help social care, aren't we, in any way we can because of the pressures they face. And we've got lots of co collaboration through Social Care Wales. This particular scheme seems to be in a well-received, excellent, a good report. I don't know whether it's in our gift, but can we in any way encourage this to be extended beyond Haldar? Because it seems to be working well there. So is there scope for other LHBs to take on that particular report, a uh, particular scheme, so we can improve the impact we're making? It's just a point, but I thought it was an interesting uh, observation you make there. Thank you, John. Um, I believe we've already extended it, but I'll hand over to Lisa to explain further. Thank you, John, actually, uh, for, uh, for that observation. And yes, absolutely. This was a scheme actually, that uh, was piloted by Howell-Zahr, and we've now actually got that interim report. I'm pleased to say actually, that we have actually started to expand, expand actually, that. Um, we've successfully recruited um, care home education facilitators across the re three regions in Wales. This is part of our clinical placement journey and it's going to enhance that opportunity across Wales. So these have only just been appointed um, and they will be starting work in January. Um, and that is actually going to be linking into our other educator facilitators in order to explore the opportunities within care homes, as well as actually enrich and encourage the education and training of those care home staff as well. So it is an exciting opportunity and I'm pleased to say, yes, we have considered that evaluation and we are taking that forward. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, thanks Lisa, that's really helpful. Good to hear. Any other comments or questions? It's a, it's a hell of a read. Oh, Tina. Yeah, Chair, I just wanted to say, I found this report particularly helpful and, um, it's a huge amount of work and I really valued reading it. And, you know, it's it's not an easy read, 
But actually, it really does, from a governance perspective, it really answered quite a lot of questions. I, you know, when you get through papers, you start to answer. So well done to the team that put this together, because I, I'm looking forward to this on a continual basis coming like this, Nicola. It was a really impressive document and read. Thank you. OK, so you've had some very positive feedback there on this, on this um, Nicola. So I, what are you asking us uh, to, to do? You're asking us to, to note this report and we've discussed it. OK, thank you very much. Aivion, uh, Director of Finance Report. Dioch, Dioch. Um, the Finance Report is with us uh, for the month seven position. That is the end of October. Colleagues will be able to see that uh, we reported an underspend of £888,000 uh, for that period. Um, within that reporting, colleagues will also note that we were anticipating income of some uh, £2.5 million pounds from Welsh Government. We've received notification that £1.5 million of that income within our plan has been received and there's uh, uh, ongoing dialogue to actually work through the remaining items as well and we are expecting progress to be made uh, soon in resolving the remaining elements. Therefore, if I take colleagues to the tables that are there uh, at the bottom of page three and at the top of page four, colleagues can see that uh, we are underspent by £374,000 in pay £283,000 in non-pay and £239,000 in commissioning budget. So we're underspent on all the key uh, headings of our uh, plan. And the reasons for those haven't changed to any great degree from what's been reported for the whole of the year. From a pay point of view, it's uh, vacancies within our structures. From a non-pay point of view, it's the... Um, underspend in travelling expenses and non-pay costs because a lot of the face-to-face -face training and uh, sessions and seminars are, are not being undertaken. And in commissioning, it's due to uh, some uh, numbers being less than what we planned for within our education activity and our training posts. So uh, having undertaken an analysis of that position, at the halfway point of the year and updated it for month seven, we're forecasting that there will be uh, an underspend in the region of three to four million pounds at year end. And we have, uh, over the last four or five weeks, been considering the action that we can take to actually uh, consider additional commitments to actually use that potential. So we've uh, identified additional commitments that HIW can uh, undertake themselves in uh, increasing and bringing forward activities from future years and uh, accelerating activities within uh, our programmes. And that's uh, likely to actually consume about £400,000 of that resource that's available. We've also uh, drawn together a programme of offering um, additional resources to our health education institutions. Now, colleagues will remember that we've done this in previous years, whereby we've offered supplementary funding at the end of the year um, to universities in, to actually aid their establishment of programmes and actually uh, to actually um, do some activities with, with their students. We didn't do it at the end of last year, because colleagues will know the contracts were coming to an end and that would have been inappropriate. But it is appropriate in this year, particularly as well, because there are a number of new programmes that have been established in universities and also a new university uh, um, undertaking services for us, education services for us. So there's a lot of new activity going on in, in universities whereby this additional resource will help them actually establish that to, the, to a high standard. So we will be offering that resource to the universities 
before Christmas. We are expecting them to respond and we will assess those response and give approval for the ones that we think are worth taking forward. And in line with the, how it worked in previous years, we will ensure that we receive notification from the universities that those that the expenditure had indeed been committed before the end of the year. So therefore, uh, it can be appropriately included as being in uh, as costs that we are properly incurred within the year. So with those uh, items, we're also considering whether additional resources would be useful to um, the Imaging Academy and uh, we might, uh, uh, which is a part of Cardiff University. So we have contacted those instit uh, institutions as well to actually see if we can actually aid with supplementary funding. We've discussed this with Welsh Government colleagues, so they're aware of the action that we are taking, and I haven't had any uh, kind of comment, adverse comments or disagreement from colleagues with what we are planning to do. There is likely to be some resource that will be left over at the year end, and again, we will return that to Welsh Government um, in line again with how we've done that in previous years. And again, it is worth bearing in mind that whilst uh, we are returning that money in year, it is worth bearing in mind in terms of the point that I made um, at the beginning of the meeting, which is we are receiving substantial increases in recurring funding from Welsh Government year on year. And therefore this small marginal kind of managing of the allocation at year end uh, is well within uh, the tolerances that should be acceptable. Moving on then from revenue to um, capital expenditure, uh, we've got a, a plan for, our, for capital spend that should see the capital programme consumed by the year end. Our balance sheet uh, is presented within the paper and there are, I've got no concerns in terms of items on the balance sheet and our PSPP target, uh, we, our position at month seven was 96.9%, uh, so well within uh, the, well over the target that's required of 95% and over. So Chair, um, I would ask the board to note the contents of the, of the paper and uh, the action that's being proposed to manage our year-end position and also note the capital balance sheet and the PSPP position. Diolch. Thank you, Ivan. I'll open this up now to board members. Jill. Yeah, very briefly, Chair. Thank, thank you, Ivy, on a very comprehensive um, report. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see that we're trying to utilise the underspend. And I know for the reasons that you've um, outlined that we couldn't do that very easy last year, but really pleased to see that, um, that we are trying very hard to use that for the right purposes. So that's, that's really good news. Um, I just wonder about two things, the effect of so many vacancies, because every variance report we have is about staff vacancies and the impact of those. And is it just that it's a turnover factor or is it that we are finding it hard to recruit to some positions and therefore the impact of that on delivery? Um, and I, you picked up the capital expenditure, but that's been fairly static, I think, for some time. And I know it's a trivial amount in terms of the overall budget, but it would just be nice to see uh, what are we going to spend it on? You know, it's only sort of 75K, but are we going to spend it? And will we have a report in January to say we've spent it or so, um, something to that effect? So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, yes, Jill and Che, uh, we can provide you with a programme in January in terms of the anticipated spend of capital. Um, Sean's nodding because she knows we've been in discussion in terms of the items, in terms of the refresh programme that we need in terms of our IT uh, and digital equipment. So the, uh, the discussion I had with co finance colleagues yesterday was that there is a programme that should see the whole 100 
100,000 uh, committed and, and spent by year end. Um, in terms of um, the other aspects, yes, in terms, it is important that we uh, commit our resources um, in, a, uh, in a responsible way, and that's why uh, we evaluate uh, at what level we could offer the health, uh, the health education institutes what we think is reasonable to offer them without making it so big that we get frivolous and maybe items that come back that uh, don't meet our uh, standards or even that they can't actually commit to spending that by the by the, the year end as well. So, so in a sense, we're, we're trying to actually manage our, our position and offer of resources to what we think uh, those institutes can actually reasonably spend. If they come back with a cracker that we think that that's something that we really should get behind and it actually means us uh, offering additional resource to take it forward, I'm sure we wouldn't actually say no uh, in terms of that uh, situation, that we would be supportive. So we would be open to um, maybe offering greater amounts but we need to be persuaded that that is the right thing to do in terms of value for money and commitment before before the year end. Uh, Julie. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so just uh, on the on the vacancies point, Joe, um, just to say, yeah, the biggest number of vacancies are in my area, so I can speak personally about that in terms of the impact on my team. And hopefully from the performance report, you'll have seen that we are kind of delivering against our objectives. Um, you know, so it is an impact on, on service delivery at the moment, but we do have a couple of workarounds that we've got in place at the moment. So we do, we are using some agency workers in a couple of areas. Um, and we've also got a couple of staff that we're using um, to set up the OCDO, the CDO's office, they're on to comment across. So it's a variety of things. Our turnover across the whole organisation is a bit higher than it has been in previous years, which is kind of natural at a three year point for an organisation. So I'm not overly concerned about that. All of our line managers know that if we need to put temporary arrangements in place, then we can do that. I think the only area where we have struggled to recruit recently has been temporary administrative officers. Um, so uh, that is something that we're looking at a bit more closely to see why we're having a problem, because we would have ordinarily you know, found it very easy to put admin staff in place to backfill. Um, I think the other material fact then is that we've only recently had um, Welsh Government approval for our infrastructure monies. So we did put a bid in alongside our IMTP earlier on this year to increase our core capacity. And while some of the areas pressed on at risk with, with exec team support, other areas held back. So that has added to the number of vacancies that we've got in the system. But we have recently trained some more job evaluators. Uh, we did that in September and we're running weekly job eval evaluation panels. So I'm quite confident we'll, we'll, um, we'll catch up with, with the vacancy situation. But at the moment, it's not having an adverse impact on delivery, but we're obviously keeping that under review. Thank you, Julie. Julie, Tina? Thanks, Chair. Um, there was a couple of questions, and I um, I guess it's not solely for um, Ivy, and it might also involve Alex and the team, is that um, we've had a couple of years now where we've been giving resources back and you know, I don't want to revisit that, but I just wonder whether there's an option here under the improvement agenda to look at how we might develop an informed, maybe a research hub or something along those lines where we can look at the key business areas that we've identified in terms of quality. And I'm thinking about the attrition rates or the retention factor of people or first destination stuff to see whether or not we could start to look at funding a master's program or PhD program with the universities to develop ski, key skilled areas of personnel within the NHSA from a workforce agenda, but actually to look at our own quality. I don't mean audit, I mean to look at um, maybe enhancing the master's level. I was thinking also about um, the mathematical um, department at Cardiff University where they look at workforce and workforce planning and models just to see whether or not that's a goer if we're constantly um, looking at ways to improve maybe it'd be useful to have some academic research and sponsoring some postdocs or some master's degrees 
that are actually employed by us. I don't think it cost an enormous amount, but I think it'd be very helpful to look at. Thanks. Alex, you coming in? Uh, yeah, happy to, to look at that, Tina. Um, we have got an evaluation and research unit being formed, as you know, called ERIC. Um, but yeah, we can have a look at um, some of those suggestions through that, through that process, yeah. Thank you. From my point of view, Avion, when I looked at the tables, um, for criteria and student benefit, I, I wondered whether student well-being should be in there, given the very prescient times we're in. Yeah. Uh, and particularly things about supporting students who are at the clinical interfaces. Yes, Chair, I can take that uh, suggestion back and uh, ensure that uh, we, we look for that and offer, offer support for those activities as well. I think, I think that would be a reflective of the times we're in. Yes, I agree. I agree. Okay. So Your... if there are no other comments or questions, um, I'm going to ask the board to note the underspend financial position at month seven. Um, the summarised explanation of key variance, variations by directorate, the capital allocation and spend to date, and the balance sheet position. Thank you very much, Avion. Diolch Fawr. Is that your last official report as finance director? Y yes, Chair. Um, yes, it is. But it, it does feel as if it was, uh, it's like, Kenny Rogers, isn't it, with his never-ending farewell tour, or, or you know, seven years going, seven times going around the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully this is it, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. This, this one's this one there needs to be watermarked. Then, okay. <laughs> All right. Dioch. Dioch, Avion. Thank you very much. So we're now going to um, structured assessment phase two. Who's picking that up? That's me, I think. Is that you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, struggle to put, struggle to come off mute. But thank, yeah. thank you for letting me come, come to the board today. Um, so this, I'm presenting the um, phase two structure assessment. So this year's structure assessment has been conducted in two phases. So phase one looked at operational planning arrangements and was considered by the audit committee in July. Um, and phase two, which I'm here to present today, covered um, has covered corporate governance and financial management arrangements. Um, I'm going to take the report as read, but if it's okay, I'll highlight a few key points. Um, so overall, this is a positive report. Um, we concluded that HOW is well governed with clear effective arrangements to manage its finances. So specifically in terms of governance arrangements, we found that um, there's an effective there are effective board and committee arrangements and the organisation is proactively uh, managing current and future independent member vacancies. Um, the annual plan received the appropriate board approvals and reflected Welsh Government's feedback um, and the organisation continues to balance supporting NHS wide recovery um, whilst also delivering, your, um, delivering uh, education and training. Um, there are also good arrangements to manage risk and audit um, recommendations. Um, and and as, all, as, all, as has already been discussed today, that um, you're improving your quality management processes to provide assurance on the quality of your training and education. Um, in terms of financial management, um, HOW achieved its financial duty in 2020-21, um, and there's a clear financial plan for 21-22. Um, the organisation continues to have strong and transparent systems of financial control to monitor your financial activity and prevent and respond to fraud. Um, and lastly, financial monitoring and reporting continues to be clear and regular, um, but there's also an opportunity to further mature reporting by including analysis on um, cost benefits, outcomes, and the impact of spending. Um, we haven't made any recommendations, but there are a few um, suggestions for improvement dotted throughout the report. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rochelle. Um, 
I'll open it up to board members. Any, any comments? Ruth? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, well, all in all, this is a very um, positive report for us and, and very welcome. But I think there are some useful pointers about what we need to be watching off as we move forward. And, uh, and I just picked up in particular what we discussed earlier, and that's the, our uh, developments of the quality management programme. Um, I just think this is something that um, if I were in uh, in um, Audit Wales shoes, I'd, I'd certainly be wanting to come back and ensure that that was progressing. So I just wanted to flag that and note it. John? Just to echo that really, Chris, I think it's a really encouraging report and uh, thanks to Ursha for her uh, presentation. I mean, we have seen, as you say, the earlier reports at the audit committee and we have been encouraged. So yeah, I, I think it's uh, really something to be welcomed. Thank you. Thank you, Rishav. I, I can't see any other hands up or comments. So um, we've been asked to um, note the, uh, the structured assessment and I think I'd like to echo picking up some of the, 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 the notes within and partic particularly about proving uh, impact. I think that, that's quite a, 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 a really good steer. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm going to move on now to Strategic Equality Action Plan Annual Review. Julie, are you okay? Where are I'm you? A, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. You're still there, are you back? I am, yeah, I'm holding on. All right. Um, so, so yeah, so, so thank you for this. Um, we thought it was timely to bring uh, just a sort of one year on a paper to the board uh, to provide some assurance of the activity during the first year and also to sort of set the scene, I suppose, for the next four years for the remainder of the strategic equality plan period. So just to remind everybody, we published our first strategic equality plan last October. Um, and that actually contained five key actions, uh, five key objectives, sorry. Uh, that reflected uh, objectives that we developed in partnership across the public sector with a number of other organisations and the plan specifically included in there 14 actions to be taken forward during this uh, financial year. So what we've given you in the report today is some highlights uh, in the cover paper, uh, more detail in appendix one um, and then an appendix two, which actually also picks up the corresponding strategic objective that's at 5.4 of our annual plan, because there's quite a bit of overlap between the two, uh, which is a good thing because that means they align. So as the paper highlights, we've um, done quite a bit this year, although there has been, uh, it took us a little bit longer than we were hoping to get the directorate plans in place and to sort out the governance. Um, but as you'll see from the paper, and from previous discussions, we have actually invested in this area in terms of capacity, and we've moved the portfolio from the people in OD team to sit with our compassionate leadership and succession team, which is just a far better alignment um, in terms of the agenda. At last month's board development session, we had um, uh, the benefit of hearing from Abu Bakr Al Madan, who's uh, an individual that we were uh, interested in hearing his story. He's also an advisor to the Heart Seed Project, uh, the Black Voices, Voices Project that we heard about last time. And we also had uh, an EDI update. So I've brought the paper here just for you to note and to be assured, hopefully that, the, um, that we're making progress and getting on with this. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Can I open this up to board members for comment or questions? Oh, I I welcome this report, Julie. It's, Thank you, Chair. It, yeah, there's there's definite progress, but it's a big journey we're on. That's 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 the downside of it. It is a very big journey. Yes. Um, but um, the team, I think, uh, as an organisation, I think our commitment to this is 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 growing, and that can only be a good thing. And some of the inspirational speakers we've had have been uh, genuinely, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a good journey. So uh, what do you want us to do this? Just note this, note the equality plan? Yes, please, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Annual review of board assurance framework, agenda item 4.5. Gilfamore Elmer. Dunnity. 
Felly adlygiad ydy hwn o'r framwaith sicrwydd y bod neu'r BAF. Mae'r PAF pyr yn cywyn o'r fersiwn diwedd araf o BAF sydd wedi atodi yn atodiad rhy un. Dyn ni'n gofyn i bod y bod yn ystyried cymryd o'r BAF sydd ger bron. O'r rhan cynnwys y BAF, mi fysyn nhw'n hoffi tynnu sylw y bod at un newid neu ychwanegiad y sylweddol eleni, a sef ychwanegiad y framwaith rheoli rysgau strategol a styryd hwn yn y cyfarfod o'r pwyllgor archwilio nôl ym mis gorffennaf. Mae framwaith rheoli rysgau strategol yn cyfnodi a mapio'r rheoliaethau a'r ffynonellau sicrwydd allweddol sydd wedi i gosod yn erbyn y rysgau strategol agic. Felly i gloi cyderydd yn ein gofyn bod y bwrdd yn ystyried a cymryd o'r baff os gwelwch yn dda. Diolch, Rhaid. Right. Any questions or comments? You had a good look at this, Jill? Yes, sorry, Chair. Um, yes, just I was just going to add that this has been reviewed um, a couple of times at the um, Audit and Assurance Committee um, and it's been thoroughly um, sort of reviewed. Okay. So we're happy to recommend it to the board. Okay, so um, we're asking the board to approve the updated board assurance framework, which includes the strategic risks control framework as attached as appendix one. So can I ask your formal approval, please? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Agenda item 4.6, amendment of the HEIW risk management policy. Ech mor iawn cydeirydd, felly mae hwn y bolisi sydd yn angen y cymryd dwyeth y bwrdd. Mae'r bolisi sy'n bodoli eisoes. Bydden ni yn gofyn heddiw wedi bod y bwrdd yn ystyried un diwygiad bach i'r bolisi. Mae hynny yn ymwneud â sut da ni'n delio gyda matur o dwyll. Ar hyn o bryd, mae yna ddynol bod dwyll yn ymddangos ar y rhestr risg cyfarwyddiaethol fel y beth safonol, beth ni'n gofyn i ddi bod tywyll yn cael ei drin fel unrhyw risg arall a bod ond yn ymddangos ar y gofrestr lle bod yna'r risg yn bodoli. Felly i gloi gofyn i'r bwrdd ystyried y polisi risg ac i ystyried y diwygiad ac i gymeradwyo y polisi os gwelwch yna. Ok. So, uh, has this been discussed at the audit committee, Jill? Sorry, Chair, did you ask me something? Yes, has this, come, has this been to the Audit Committee? No, I don't believe it has. Yes, yes. it has. Yes, yes, sorry. yes it has. It's, it's covered within the, uh, the, uh, the summary report later on. So, yes. All right. Okay. So, um, we're asking then to approve the amendment to uh, amendments to the um, risk management policy and uh, approve the amended policy as Appendix 1. Can I ask your approval, please? Yes. Yep. Thank you very much. Welsh language scheme update. Yeah, the man now is all I went Maur, Mark Commission is Ria Gamrag or Diwedd Wedi Kmeraduyo, a Kentliniaith and Agic, but can come with a board where he can not be a Kentliniaith nor a Miss Mouth. Then he went to talk to the other job, the other Thirgana Commission is and Kmeraduyo and Kentliniaith, and he'd a copy or Kentliniaith. Um, I, I don't want to embarrass you by asking him to translate comments about himself, uh, but I'd just like to congratulate him and to thank him for his uh, considerable amount of work uh, in pulling together the Welsh language scheme. It's, uh, it's a considerable achievement. It's a really chunky piece of work, and we are absolutely delighted to receive um, a confirmation that the Welsh language commissioner is, is, is happy and content with our Welsh language scheme. So, Right, well, we're in Valthwedi, Kyle Hunan Adnabi. And Dioch uh, David, a Dioch Hill, I'm a Goyth, I Kyle Hon, and a Say Right, 
So, um, are there any questions or comments on this? In that case, I'm asking the board to note that the uh, that we have the endorsement from the Welsh Language Commissioner. Well done, everybody. Well done. Um, I'm now going on to the reports from the uh, our committees. Uh, key, key issue reports. The first is the Audit and Assurance Committee held on the 21st of October. Uh, Jill? Thank you, Chair. Um, apologies. Um, There's a slight time lag, so sorry I didn't pick up um, <laughs> what you were asking me previously. Um, I'll be really, really brief in the interest of time, because um, it was a very full agenda at the Audit and Assurance Committee. Um, we approve revisions to the financial control procedures, an update on internal audit and the recruitment report. Um, pleased to see that we're still receiving reasonable or better assurance levels from internal audit, which is always good for the organization. Um, received an update on the Audit Wales work. Um, the committee, as you know, have taken a keen interest in the improvements plan for procurement um, in HEIW, and we were pleased to see that there was progress on that, um, and we'll continue to monitor that um, for the organisation. Um, the BAF's already been um, discussed on the agenda today, um, and then there were three items on information governance um, significant progress on the key issues and the toolkit, which was very pleasing for the audit committee because, uh, again, something that we flagged up from an early stage as a risk. And also the terms of reference for the information governance and information management group, um, which is recommended to the board for approval. And that's part of the recommendation today. Okay, so um, are there any questions for Jill? In that case, uh, we're asked to note the content of the report from the chair and we're asked to approve the terms of reference of the Information Governance and Information Management Group. Can I ask your approval, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we now come to the in-committee decisions in the paper. I'd like like you to note the report for information and I'd like uh, given uh, the your declared interest Ivion okay we note that um, I'm asking the board to ratify the decision to award a T dusky contract to the winning provider think learning of the open tender process so can I ask you to ratify please yes can I can I ask that we we make arrangements to affix the common seal and sign the contract, David. Uh, that, we, you only need to fix a common seal where we have a deed. This is not a deed. This is a, an old contract. Okay. Holy chip. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and I, just to, just to clarify, I think uh, Avion's declaration of interest related to a, a matter that's been dealt with in closed session. I don't think it relates to the, the Dusky contract. All right. Thank you. And now we come to uh, for noting. 5.1 NHS Wales Shared Service Partnership Committee Assurance Report. David? Uh, the, the, the report is just for noting, Chair. Okay. And then the Corporate Risk Register. Can I just confirm that everybody's seen the Corporate Risk Register? Uh, Alex? Sorry, just wanted to make a comment on the previous item that um, we also had a joint executive team meeting with Shared Services. Um, last week, um, which is really helpful and covered a number of items that are on our agenda, including procurement, single lead employer, bursary, etc. And we will have those on a, a six monthly basis going forward. Excellent. Okay. And the corporate risk register, can I just uh, confirm everybody has seen the corporate risk register? Okay. Thank you very much. I've got no other urgent business. I'm sure you will all be relieved of that. Um, and our next board meeting is a board development session on the 16th of December. And then we will have our board open board meeting um, on the 27th of January, again by uh, Zoom or teleconference, whichever. And I now resolve that we go into in committee. 
Can I suggest a 10 minute comfort break at this juncture? There's a quarter of an hour actually between the agendas. 15 minutes, oh. Because we have had a long morning, so that would be- We have had a very long morning. Can I thank you all for your concentration and your, and your involvement? Thank you very much, everybody. See you in 15 minutes. Thank you.